Dr Perry, I'm going to ask you to look um, at an, a different aspect now of the um, evidence you gave to the Penrose Inquiry. PRSE 0001258, please, Sully, page three. Um, so this is part of uh, one of your statements um, on the topic of viral inactivation 85 to 87. Um, can I just pick up what you say um, on this page, uh, at the top of the page, when it became known in 1984 that coagulation factor concentrates were implicated in transmission of HIV, the SMBTS and Haemophilia Centre Director's strategy to protect patients from infection with HIV included the following key elements. And then can we have the next paragraph, please? Uh, um, so you then set out three key elements. The first was um, avoiding the need to import commercial products through the already established programme to achieve and maintain self-sufficiency. So that's essentially a continuation of what you were already doing. Yes. Um, the second was rapid and progressive development of manufacturing processes capable of inactivating HIV um, following the announcement that HIV could be inactivated by heat treatment, and I'll, I'll come on to that in, in, in a little while. And then the third um, key element was the development and implementation of a system of batch dedication to reduce the exposure of patients to multiple batches introduced in early 1985. Again, I'll come on to that in a little more detail um, in a little while. Um, um, if, if we just go back to the whole paragraph, please, Sully. Now, it's right to say you were describing this as um, a strategy that included those key elements. Um, I, so you weren't suggesting this was the only thing that was um, un under contemplation. Um, but is it right to understand that um, uh, um, the, the strategy within Scotland to protect patients from infection with HIV did not include a reversion to cryoprecipitate? Um, I, I, I don't recall there being, from my perspective at least, I don't recall there being a, a, a significant reversion to the use of cryoprecipitate. I think it would almost certainly have been discussed at, at, at various levels and at various times, but I, I, I don't think that actually occurred. No, and I, I then just want to show you, um, I think, three documents where there's a discussion in the course of 1984 of the issue and to invite your perspective. Um, the first is PRSE 0004741. Now, these are notes prepared in January 1984 by Dr. Cash, and we can see their notes for Scottish Health Service Haemophilia Centre Transfusion Service Directors Meeting February 84. So prepared by him in anticipation of the, the, the meeting that was going to take place the, the following month. The annual meeting, yes, of that group. Yeah. Um, do, do you know, was, was that Dr Cash's um, practice, to, pre to prepare something in advance of the yes, meeting? Yes, he would always prepare a, um, a briefing document, effectively, um, and, and also raising issues that he thought were important. So and that was his practice, yes. And so if we can go on to page four... Um, under the heading AIDS, so bottom half of the page, he refers first of all to the introduction of the uh, leaflet um, for, for donors. Uh, and then he says this, clinical colleagues' attention is drawn to a leading article published in the BMJ by Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones concludes, for the moment it seems sensible to treat very young, severely affected children with cryoprecipitate rather than concentrates. The SNBTS directors would welcome comments on this proposal. And then the next paragraph, it is noted that cryoprecipitate is no longer issued for haemophilia care at the Inverness and Aberdeen centres. And the size of current intermediate stocks would normally lead to the consideration with the SNBTS of the introduction of similar practices in other regions. Now, just, just if I may I, I, I try and unpick that with you, obviously the paragraph referring to Dr Jones is self-evident and as I understand it, but Dr. Cash is, is inviting the views of SNBTS directors on the proposal of, of, of cryoprecipitate for children. And, and haemophilia directors. Yes. Um, and then um, uh, there's reference to two of the centres no longer issuing cryoprecipitate, um, one, one assumes a, a, a tool. Um, but it, it's that last part of the, the, the second, uh, of, the, of that last paragraph that I wanted your help with. The size of current intermediate stocks, is that a reference to the volume of 
intermediate purity um, uh, factor concentrate that's been built up? Oh, obviously, I'm with you. Sorry, so it's, it's the paragraph... Yes, uh, the last paragraph in the AIDS yes, section. Yes, yes, sorry, just, sorry, just um, very yes. Um, you know the current... Uh, I, I, I can only um, try and construct a, a view on what Professor Cash meant by that. I think he's, what, what he's actually signalling is that there are large stocks of, 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 of intermediate... Um, con I, I'm not sure whether what the stocks he's talking about, actually. The size of current intermediate stocks um, would normally lead to the consideration with SMBTS introduction of similar practices in other regions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can help you. I was going to say that he was making the point that we have high stocks of a, of a factor eight concentrate, which in normal circumstances would lead to a discontinued use of cryoprecipitate. But I'm not, I but I'm not sure where he's saying that because uh, you wouldn't describe the stock, the stock of, of factor eight concentrates, national stocks of factor eight concentrates as current intermediate stocks. That would be a curious way of expressing it. Um, uh, um, if we go over two pages then, um, uh, if we see, if we look at the bottom half of the page, you'll see the heading limitation of batch exposure to individual patients. Um, I'm not going to read through the detail of that, um, but if, if we look at just at the very bottom of the page, he says it's suggested to directors that in view of the current significant national reserves of SNBTS intermediate factor eight, top of the next page. That the time is opportune to direct efforts towards reducing the number of batch exposures per patient per year. Um, so it, it, is, is that Dr. Cash in January 1984 identifying the possibility of, of having a batch dedication system or policy introduced? Yes, I think so. I think he, he wrote to, um, as we saw yesterday, he wrote a letter to uh, regional transfusion centre directors um, in late 1983 um, asking for um, uh, updated information on product stocks, but also their views and ideas on a, on a batch dedication type of system. So, yes. And he was, uh, he was reiterating that here. Um, so if we then move to the actual meeting for which the document was prepared, PRSE 0001556, please. Um, so we can see it's meetings of directors of SNBTS and haemophilia directors, 2nd of February 1984. Uh, we can see that you were present. Um, if we go over the page... Point five is headed review paper from SNBTS, and there's reference to Dr. Cash introducing uh, the paper he prepared, which I take as a reference to the document we've just looked at. Yes. Um, and then we see the discussion on cryoprecipitate um, at um, Roman paragraph two, uh, which was members discuss the suggestion that the production of cryoprecipitate could now be reduced. Dr. Ludlam said that cryoprecipitate was preferred in the treatment of children at patient because of the new danger of AIDS. Dr. Han concurred. A policy seemed to be emerging, however, to use less cryo for haemophilia A patients. It was agreed that a certain minimal amount of cryo was required, and Dr. Cash pointed out that TDs, uh, transfusion directors, I assume, could produce it in emergencies. Um, and D D Dr. Foster told us his recollection of the discussion um, about cryoprecipitate at that meeting. Do you have any recollection of, of the discussion and, and what the, the, the views were that were being expressed or what Dr. Cash's position was? I, I, I don't have any um, uh, recollection from, from my memory. I can only um, interpret what is probably, me what probably meant here. And, I, and, it, and, it, and it seems to me that what was being, or what was agreed, was that there was there was clearly a, an ongoing need for cryoprecipitate for treatment of some groups of patients, but it wasn't signalling um, a large increase, for example. Um, but Professor Cash also made the point that 
if there was a large increase in the need for cryoprecipitate for children or other groups of, of patients, then, then it can be produced at relatively short notice. Um, and then just oh, still on the topic of cryoprecipitate, um, if we can go to SBTS 40615 underscore 042, please. Yeah, SBTS 00000615 underscore 042. Um, now, this is a meeting, this is a few days later in February 1984, the 7th of February, and it's a special meeting of the coordinating group. C can you just remind us the, what the coordinating group was? Uh, the, 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 I think the, the title of the, of the meeting, which was established in, in the late 1970s, or in the 1970s under, under Dr. Cash's predecessor, um, and, it, and its role was... An, it reflected the fact that he was not in charge, but he had a specific role um, um, uh, to coordinate the activities of the individual um, operational centres within the SMBTS. So this was a meeting, I think it was held every three months or maybe more frequently um, um, for, for general discussion of um, um, topics that, that, that were important to the SMBTS. And we can pick up the discussion on AIDS at page four of the minutes. Towards the bottom of the page, we've got the heading AIDS. There's reference to a report being circulated by Dr. McClelland. And then a number of matters being agreed. Um, the first is that Dr. Cash will write recommending a single UK working group with Scottish representation. The second refers to revisions to the, uh, the, the donor leaflet. If we go over the page to the top of the next page, please. Oh, if we just zoom in on the top half of the page, thanks. We don't need to zoom in any further. Um, but there's then a reference to donor screening studies, uh, um, a, a plasma processing policy, um, uh, auto transfusion, and then this at F, small pool factor eight. It was noted that small pool freeze-dried cryoprecipitate for haemophilia therapy may have to be reassessed. Um, now, just, just before we look at the next sentence, is it right to understand that's referring to the, the type of cryoprecipitate that had been manufactured in that project at the Law Hospital? In the west of Scotland, yeah, yes. Which had the, then been abandoned. At, but, but that, by that's my understanding, yes. yeah. And then it says Dr Perry said he could manufacture such a product given the appropriate resources. Yes. Um, um, can you recall anything further about that discussion and, and assist us in understanding what the appropriate resources would have been? I, I think I was simply signalling if, if, if that's what the service required, um, i.e. the haemophilia directors, if a decision... Uh, by that stage, I thought the discussion about freeze-dried cryoprecipitate was was finished and, uh, and the idea of producing it had, had been... Um, discontinued in, in 1983. Um, I, I think I was simply signalling that if there is a reversal of that decision and, uh, and there's a clinical consensus that we need freeze-dried cryoprecipitate as a treatment option, then the PFC could produce that product, but it would need, as I described yesterday, quite extensive um, re reconfiguring of, of the f uh, production facilities at PFC. Um, is it right to understand that this idea was never taken any further? I'm not aware of freeze-dried cryoprecipitate um, emerging as a product from SMBTS. Um, can I then move to later in 1984 and the discovery of HTLB3 seroconversion in a group of Dr. Ludnam's patients? So we can take the document down slowly, thank you. Um, what's your best recollection of how and when you learnt of um, uh, the, the first news um, that, that uh, a PFC product may have transmitted HIV? Well, clearly this was a, this was a major and, 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 and devastating event um, for SMBTS um, and, 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 and obviously for patients. Um, I th my, my recollection of the first time I heard this um, was on, which may be wrong, 
because I think there's there's some evidence, though not conclusive, that that there was that it was known uh, before this date. But my my recollection is that I I learnt about this for the first time on my return from um, uh, the meeting in Groningen, the the, the conference in Groningen, um, on the 5th of November. Um, but it may have been because the very early information that, that came through that Dr. Foster has described, and uh, he, he has a good memory of things, and, uh, and, he has, uh, and he has kept scrupulous diaries, is that the earliest information that the, the PFC might have known about it was a, um, as a result of a telephone call to Dr. Cuthbertson. Um, but that may have been about the, the very earliest reports of three patients having what, what he thought, which may have uh, three patients who may have antibodies to HTLV3. But I think at that stage, for those three patients, uh, Professor Ludlam was, was looking for a, a confirmation of that because the, the assays that were being used were research assays. They weren't established, fully validated assays. So I think he, he, he wanted. But, but my memory is that the first time I heard about it was when I returned from the Groningen conference. Whatever the precise date, yeah. can you remember the, the, your reaction and, and the reaction within PFC? Um, difficult to describe it. Actually, it was a, it was a it, it was a very um, uh, shocking and shocking and devastating news. Not shock in terms of a, a major surprise. How could this ever have happened? But. Um, um, uh, and, and it, it had a had a profound impact throughout the centre, and, and from that point forward, I think there was there was very little discussed in PFC, other than its programme of work to actually deal with this. Um, would it be right to understand that, um, in a sense, it was it was not unexpected? I think Dr. Foster had told us, or we looked at some evidence Dr. Foster had given to the Lindsay Tribunal, reflecting the idea that it was it was really only a matter of time. Do you remember that being the, the, the sense at the time? I think that was a, a, a perfectly legitimate view and probably a, a, a view that I held myself. There was another view that the, 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 the um, epidemiology of HTLV3 was still focused and concentrated in the United States and, and uh, maybe it was more a hope than, a, than, than an evidence-based conclusion. But that it had yet to enter in, in any significant way into the UK blood supply. Do, do you remember um, ha, um, ha, how and when you learnt of the possible, uh, any similar events having taken place in, in England? No, no. Um, if we just go then, um, just to pick up on a handful of dates, to PRSE 00000828, please, Sally. This is a memo that Dr. McClelland wrote, <coughs> excuse me, to you, 20th of November 1984, um, um, setting out events leading up to the recall of Factor 8 Batch 02311 yeah. And so we can just see some of the staging posts along the way to the decision in principle to recall. So paragraph one refers to Dr. Ludlam phoning Dr. McClelland in the evening of the 26th of October. Um, uh, um, reporting 16 fully act patients having developed antibody to HTLB3, three of whom he thought could be attributable to PFC products. Um, and then, sorry, Sally, can we have the whole section on, on the screen? It's slightly easier, thank you. Point two re refers to Dr. McClellan just reporting that to Dr. Cash on the Saturday. Um, says we both agreed that the information was insufficient to require any recall of PFC products. Now, I um, appreciate that Dr. Cash obviously was the overall director of SNBTS, but um, it, there doesn't appear to be recorded there any communication with you um, or, or, or with Dr. Cuthbertson or anyone else directly at PFC at that early stage. Is that, is that you, your recollection that, that's, as well? That's my recollection. I think that, that's right. At that stage, um, all that was known that there were three patients um, that had had produced this this positive result in a in a research HTLV3 assay run by um, Dr. Tedder, um, and uh, 
I, d I don't think PFC had any further information. At, at that stage, the analysis of the batch consumption hadn't been done, so there was actually uh, th there was no idea which batches might be implicated. That work had to, w was carried on over the weekend and, uh, and, and, and on 29th and 30th of October, I think. Um, we can then see on, uh, on the Friday of the 2nd of November, so uh, essentially a week later, there's a reference to Dr. Ludlam telephoning Dr. Um, McClelland at home, having received further data from Dr. Tedder. Um, and, and Dr. McClelland records that an initial look at these data indicated that either 15 or 16 of these patients had received the above batch. Um, and then paragraph 5 says October the 3rd, I think someone said, uh, written, I'm sure this should be November, um, so I'll, I'll assume that's right, I think, November the 3rd, it records Dr. Bolton and Dr. McClelland contacting all the Scottish transfusion centres and the Northern Ireland transfusion centre to notify them that the above batch should be immediately recalled, also contacting the duty officer at the PFC to let him know of the action that had been taken. Do you know who that... Would that have been Dr Cuthbertson at that stage? I think that would have been Dr Cuthbertson. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, were you in Groningen at that, at that I point? I was in Groningen at that time, yes. Um, well, that's my recollection. Yeah, I was certainly at the meeting, so I would have been in Groningen. Yes. Um, so it's, it's just over a week... Um, from Dr. Ludlam first contacting Dr. McClelland to Dr. Bolton and Dr. McClelland um, notifying the, the regional transfusion centres that that particular batch should be recalled. Uh, um, do, do you think it was, from your perspective as director of the PFC, that that was done quickly enough or, or, or whether it could have been done any quicker? The, the only the only delay that was injected into the into the overall time scale from the from the, the initial results was the the need to uh, analyze effectively manually because there was there were no computers around at that time um, the batch uh, the um, to, to try and do the um, uh, identify which patients had received what batches and and then come to a, a conclusion as to which might be the implicated batches because there were many many batches. Um, that have been used to treat those patients. Um, and, and that would clearly take, uh, yes, a matter of days to collect the data from patient records and, and, and so on. Uh, if, if we then go to L-O-T-H, six zeros, five, underscore zero, five, two, please. Uh, this is a letter... Um, from Dr. McClelland uh, on the 15th of November 1984 to Dr. Cash. Um, the first paragraph says, I've had several discussions with Dr. Christopher Ludlam following the discovery that some recipients of PFC factor 8 have developed antibodies to HTLV3, um, which must at present be attributed to infusions of PFC product. I spent several hours this morning with Dr. Ludlam and Dr. Perry reviewing the data and right now to report to you as National Medical Director on our conclusions. Can you recall what that, that, that meeting and, and what the process was that was being undertaken? The, what was the date of this letter? So the, it's the 15th of November. 15th of November. I, I think it was uh, um, a meeting with Dr Ludlam, myself and, and Dr McClelland, um, really just going over again. The, I, I have a, a, a faint memory and recollection of... Of, of, of sitting down and, and examining the, um, the, the patient, not the not the individual patient records, but the um, a, a, an analysis of the uh, patient exposures to different batches and the, and the rationale for concluding that it was batch three zero zero nine, which was the most likely candidate batch that had transmitted HTLV three. And we can see from the third paragraph, um, um, the analysis had been that. Um, all but one of the patients had received that batch. There's then a description of looking at batches received, sorry, yes, batches received by, um, uh, or other batches received by the patients. If we yes. go over the page. Um, just picking it up below par the paragraph numbered six, refers to... Um, one patient who didn't receive the implicated batch and was not known to have other risk factors. Um, now, obviously, I'm not, we're not going to say anything which potentially identifies any individual patient, and you, I suspect, probably wouldn't have that information to hand anyway. But um, 
it's right, isn't it, I think, that it was never established um, how that one patient who hadn't received that batch had been in infected. Um, I, I'm not absolutely clear on, on the final outcome. What I, what I do know is in, in, in subsequent analysis of data and um, th there was found to be a total of 18 patients yes. in Scotland and, and, and I think our conclusion from the analysis that was done by Dr Cuthbertson and others of, of, of the detailed information we had was that there, are, there were probably three batches that were that that, that had that, that, that could be described as as being suspect for the um, transmission of H of HTLV3. I don't think any of those three still account for the 16th patient in that in that patient cohort. So potentially there may have been a fourth batch, but there may, there may have been a fourth batch. Yes, or a... um, and at this point in time. Um, uh, there were no other batches that were withdrawn? No, it was only batch 3009. Um, now, so we can take that down. Well, batch 3009 had been consumed. It had all been used up in Edinburgh, and there was uh, about 40 or 45 vials left in Aberdeen. Yes. So the only physical material that came back was from was Aberdeen. Was the Aberdeen. Mm. Uh, um, now, now, we know that um, from, from your evidence and the evidence of others that and the, uh, what, what happened over the following weeks was a, um, a process of, of heating, dry heating, the stock of factor eight concentrates that the PFC had built up um, with a view to issuing that then to, 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 to patients from, I think, late, from a date in December 1984 10th onwards. 10th of December. Um, 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 uh, and, um, can you recall what the process was for um, receiving back in from centres or patients unheated concentrate? Um, I, ca I can't describe the, the details of the process uh, other than to say that when we initiated the recall um, or we, we instructed the regional transfusion centres, they were already aware of this issue, of course, and, and the instruction was to recall product from uh, held in the, in the regional transfusion centres, uh, to recall product that, that may have been held in haematology departments or, or haemophilia directors or in haemophilia centres, uh, and also from patients' um, home stocks as well. So it was, a, it was a, a, an in-depth recall. Was it a formal product recall, or was it a, a, essentially a product exchange program whereby people were asked to bring in such st stocks that they had? I'm thinking in terms of the patients here. Sorry, I should have made that I'm, 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 I hope I've not um, lost the thread here. Uh, we're talking about the recall of batch 3009. No, I'm sorry. Oh, you're no. talking about the exchange uh, of... Okay. Yes. I'm so, sorry. So I, we'll I, leave aside that batch because you're absolutely right as to what happened in relation to that okay. batch. Edinburgh had used up all of it, yeah. as I understand the position. Okay. Aberdeen had not. There was a formal recall of, of the remaining vials from, from Aberdeen. Okay. Um, no, I'm talking about what happened um, up to, in order to give effect to the decision oh. to, to now issue only heated product. Yes, I, un I understand. What, what was the process that was undertaken to try and get back as much unheated product and replace it with heated well, product? Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was not a, I, it, in all practical respects, it was a recall, um, but um, we described it as a product exchange because recalls are usually associated with a known defect or a known issue and so on. And there was, uh, other than the batch that we recalled, there was no reason to suspect these other batches all the rest of the stock. Um, so we, we, we called it, or we have subsequently um, described it more as a product exchange. Um, and, and the process was very similar to that which we used for, for any recall, except on this occasion, um, we once again drilled, um, drilled down into, into the detail of the supply chain. And as far as I recall, we, the instruction was um, that, that um, coordinated by regional transfusion centre staff because they were responsible for distribution. They should recover stocks from haemophilia centres, um, haematology, um, any, any stock, any place where the, 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 the product was, was stocked and also from um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the stocks held by patients in their homes. So in terms of the, the process of getting any stocks held by patients in their homes, 
Do you know whether that was coordinated or was ex intended to be coordinated by the transfusion centres or by the haemophilia centres? Well, it would have been coordinated by the, the transfusion centres, but they would have they would have clearly corresponded or or, or, or um, discussed the requirements with the haemophilia directors, and it would be for the haemophilia directors then to speak to their individual patients. So, to the best of my knowledge, that process worked perfectly well. We didn't get any. Um, for instance, um, late returns of, of product that should have been sent back. The intention, the system was set up so that by the 10th of December, every patient in Scotland and Northern Ireland should have access to heat-treated factor eight. And to the best of my knowledge, that was achieved. Um, can we then just look at... Sorry, I've, I've, um, I've, I've slightly misled you. The, the recall that I've described didn't take place until January. That makes a little more we, sense. We quite, we, 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 uh, uh, clearly, you can't do the two things simultaneously. You can't fully recall and issue new stock at the same time. It would have been too confusing. So we put a hold on all, the, all use of... Um, uh, we, we, the first step was to, to issue product that had been heat treated to every centre in Scotland so that, that could be distributed um, um, throughout the centres and, and, and where necessary to patients' homes. When that was complete and we built up further stocks of heat-treated product, we then did the formal recall in early January. Um, can we then just look at one further meeting at this time, which is PRSE 00002066? So this is a meeting of haemophilia directors and SMBTS directors, 29th of November, 84. You were present. We can see from paragraph two, the purpose of the meeting, convened to discuss the implications of the recent finding of HTLV3 antibodies in Scottish uh, haemophiliacs. Um, and then um, if we go over the page, um, there's an update in paragraph six from you of what's being done by PFC in terms of um, heat treatment, um, and, and it's explained the, the, the um, measure that was being implemented in terms of uh, heat treatment of existing stocks at 68 degrees for, for two hours. Um, if we then go further down the page, just wanted to pick up on, on paragraph eight and whether you have any recollection of, of this. Views were exchanged on the very difficult ethical problems which had arisen. These included whether patients and patients' relatives should be informed and perhaps subjected to needless worry, whether publicity additional to that already provided should be given and how directors should respond to direct inquiries or requests for advice. Um, the chairman advised members that ministers have been informed that... Um, SIO had been briefed uh, while a press statement would not be issued by the department of present any inquiries would be answered it was agreed that every effort should be made for patients to have the situation explained to them before the impending publicity now I'm not suggesting that informing patients was the responsibility um, of, of, of PFC um, um, uh, Dr Perry but um, you were present at this meeting and it appears to be suggested that there was some question mark over whether patients and their relatives should be told or not. And this was described as a very difficult ethical problem. It might be thought fairly obvious that they should be told. Do you, do you have yeah. any reflection or any recollection of that I, discussion? I, I, I don't have um, a detailed recollection of my focus and emphasis at the time. And, and probably during this meeting was making sure I clearly communicated what the PFC was doing in, 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 in its response. I think I would have regarded this very much as the, the business of haemophilia directors in, in, in describing the issues that arise, uh, that, that, that arises in terms of their um, conversations with patients. And uh, I would have noted it. I would have understood it. I would have understood their concerns. Um, but I wouldn't have had any further input into that particular decision. And we know a meeting took place, a group meeting, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary yeah, in yes, December. Yes, We've yes. had evidence about that from, from Dr. Ludlam and, yes. and from attendees at the meeting. Were you present at that meeting? No, I wasn't. Dr. McClellan from South East Scotland BTS and I think uh, the haemophilia director from Glasgow also attended. I think that was um, 
Dr. Forbes at that time. Or but you did not in any way? I didn't attend it, no. But then I won't ask you anything further in relation to that. Um, can I just look at, ask you to look then at one document from the evidence submitted to Penrose, PRSE 0002801, please. Now, I'm not proposing to go through the detail of this. It, it's a report describing actions surrounding Batch 3009. Um, and if we go to page 5, um, we'll see that there's, a, there's a, a fairly detailed narrative of the actions taken uh, uh, over the page... There's then a description of the history of this particular batch um, uh, uh, um, when it was um, uh, manufactured and, and so on. I'm not going to ask you about the, the detail of that because we've got, got it set out in, in the report. But there's just one passage I wanted to ask you about. If we go to page 10... Um, it's this, under the heading Introduction of Heat Treatment says this, it should be noted that the finding of HIV infection in Scottish haemophiliacs was unexpected, since until that time the belief was that the infection was largely confined to donors in the USA. Now, I don't know whether you were an, an author or co-author of, of, of this particular paper, Dr Perry, but if I can perhaps ask you more, more generally, do, do you agree with that? sentence that it was I, unexpected I, I, I didn't author this paper although I think I was involved and I had input into it, um, it it's probably not the word I would use now I think it was um, perhaps in, and, and Dr Foster has explained and to an extent I would agree with him that it was um, it was just a matter of time um, I, I, I think it was it was unexpected in, in the sense that we did believe or, we, or at least we had a, a, an evidence based hope that the, 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 the epidemic was um, mainly confined to the US at that time. Well, one of the issues explored with Dr. McClelland, um, Dr. Brian McClelland, when he gave evidence to, 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 to this inquiry, was um, whether there were particular risk factors perhaps associated with Edinburgh in terms of high risk donors. Yes. Yeah. Um, a, 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 as, as a centre of international travel, location of the Edinburgh Festival, um, population in terms of uh, uh, um, drug use and so on. Yes. Um, do, do, do you remember that being something that was um, uh, explicitly discussed back in 83, 84, so prior to the October 84 um, discovery of the, of the seroconversion of this particular cohort of patients? Do you recall PFC ever giving any particular thought to that or there being any discussions between PFC and SEBTS? I, there, there could well have been discussions. Um, it would have been... It, the discussions would have taken place at the coordinating group or directors' meetings because uh, they were the people involved in, in, in the interface with donors and, and so these issues were constantly on the agenda, um, donor selection. Um, but I, 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 I'm afraid I can't recall any any specific issues I, I think at, at that stage it was it was un, uh, although what you've described as the, you know the, the, the potential risk factors of um, um, drug use and uh, and so on it being a fairly international city at least for one month in a year um, it's uh, I, I, I think that the, the the, the general the general view was that um, um, we, 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 that we, we simply didn't know um, what the, the nature of the epidemiology of HIV at that time. There were no assays. The, the diagnosis was, was only available through patients presenting with clear signs of AIDS. So, and then just going briefly back to the implicated batch from the, from the autumn of 1984, is this right that it was possible to identify from records um, all the donors who had contributed to that batch, um, which was, a, I think, approximately 4,000. About 4,000, yes. Yeah. But it was, n it was never established um, which particular donor or donors that, that, that was certainly um, my understanding when I, when I 
um, left the SMBTS, and I, and I don't think there's been any further clarity on that um, use it, using the assay systems that were available at the time. None of the donors, and, 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 and yes, I think, as, as you probably already know, the, the PFC um, had a, a complete traceability system associated yes. with these products. Um, then just a handful of further questions about, about zero conversions, um, if, if I may. Um, can we just start, first of all, at CBLA 0001919? Um, now, this is not a meeting in which you were involved, Dr. Perry. It's a meeting of the um, Central Committee for Research and Development in Blood Transfusion, November 1984, 9th of November 1984, but you'll see that Dr. McClelland, Dr. Brian McClelland, was there. Yes. If we go over the page, um, the um, third paragraph under the heading developments with respect to AIDS says this, um, and, and this is a particular point I've been asked to, to, to see whether you can um, understand, uh, help, us, help us understand or clarify, um, Dr. Perry. Dr. McClelland referred to a batch of factor eight in Scotland fractionated in November 1983 which was discovered to con contain anti-HTLB3 in August 1984. And then there's reference to the remainder of the project having been withdrawn, but the incident served to highlight the difficulties which lay ahead. Now, w was there a discovery in August 1984, or, or, or is that, to, to the best of your knowledge, simply an error in the minutes? I, I think it, it must be an, an error in the, in, in the recording of, of, of the minute. We, we had no knowledge of HTLV3 being in, 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 in any batch of PFC product in August 1984. Okay, thank you. That's, that's what I wanted to um, check with you. I, 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 I don't know the genesis of that statement. But I say it, it seems like a, it's just an error of um, reporting. Um, now, if the next document, please, is at... Um, BNOR 0000177. We go to the second page, please. Um, so this is a letter uh, from Dr. Snape at BPL to Dr. Jean Harrison, the North East Thames Regional Transfusion Centre, 26th of July, 1985. And we can see from the bottom right-hand corner it was copied to you. Um, if, if we then just go just above the page, up the page a bit, please, Sally. Um, so we can see it's headed Advice of Transfusion Incident and Product Recall Notice. And then there's reference to um, a BPL product and then PFC 795. Um, uh, and then the letter says that Dr. Snape had been informed by Dr. Kraska, a patient treated at the London Hospital, had developed a, a, an illness consistent with HTLV3 infection. The batches implicated are HLA and HLB3185 and then PFC batch 795. And it's described that the Regional Transfusion Centre had received 947 vials of PFC 795 in their, uh, as their September allocation. Um, now that um, presumably is a reference to the, the distribution of PFC products uh, um, uh, when you were sending part of the stockpile or surplus right. to BPL, That's which we looked exactly. at yesterday, <laughs> that, 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 yes. that would be consistent with the timing. Yeah. Um, do, do you know what, if any, um, follow-up was, was done or what, if any, investigation was done into, into PFC 795? Um, no, I think, um, j just for clarification, where it describes the batches implicated, it doesn't necessarily imply that there's a causal association with batch 795 or any of the other batches. It's, it's just a description yes. of, the patient, of, of what the patient's received. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm afraid I only... I, I think this... Um, I only saw this letter again recently yes. in, the, in, the, in the bundle of results, so I haven't had the opportunity of researching it. I can only say that when that was received at PFC, that, that, that would certainly have been subject to evaluation and, and, and follow-up and so on. But I don't think batch 795 was ever um, uh, identified as a, as a batch that either contained a, an HIV-positive donation or not. Um, and then 
Um, if we go to PRSE 0001773, please. Um, there's an exchange of correspondence here um, between, well, th this particular letter is Dr. Forbes um, to Dr. Cash, February uh, 1986, referring to having become aware of three seroconversions in the past year in patients receiving blood products. Uh, and then um, there's a... Um, I think a follow-up letter, if we go to MACK 0001780 underscore 001. You then wrote to Dr. Mazuk at, um, in Glasgow in July of the same year, HDLV3 seroconversions in West of Scotland haemophiliacs. You recall our discussions regarding the seroconversion of two haemophiliacs in your region. I now enclose a brief report on our findings, which attempts to relate these two incidents to the seroconversions in Edinburgh. As you'll see, we can draw no definite conclusion. And then I think the report that, that is referred to in this letter is at PRSE. 0003506. Um, um, and we can see it's headed um, HGLV3 seroconversions related to SNBTS factor 8, an interim report. The first paragraph refers to the, the Edinburgh seroconversions. And then the second paragraph says follow up of West of Scotland haemophiliacs has re revealed two patients receiving SNBTS factor 8 who Ciro converted in 1983 and 1985, respectively. Um, and then we can skip over the details of the two patients. It then says the batches of product received by the South East and West of Scotland Ciro converters are summarised in the table. Point one, neither of the West of Scotland patients received the implicated Edinburgh batch. No batch was common to the two West of Scotland Ciro conversions. If SMBTS factor 8 was responsible for each of the 18 zero conversions, then at least three contaminated batches must have been issued. There's then an identification of batches common to both zero conversions. And then if we go over the page, um, it says none of the batches received by any of the zero converters are known to have contained an HGLB3 positive donation. And um, further action at this time. No information is available at PFC on the quantities of each batch received by the two West of Scotland zero converters. Um, do, do you know, uh, other than identifying that, that there were um, potentially at least three contaminated batches that must have been issued from PFC on the basis of the, the, the information you had about those zero converted, do you know whether there was any particular follow up to this investigation or whether any conclusions were reached as to which other batches and how many? I, I, have, I have no recollection of any additional data or evidence coming to light um, uh, beyond that, that, that which has been reported here. Mm -hmm. my, my, my memory is that there were, uh, it, it was established fairly early on that there were at least three batches, but I don't, I don't think there are. I think we requested further information from Dr. Maddock in my, in my letter. I'm not sure whether that was received or whether it was um, significant. Um, uh, and then finally, on this um, topic, can we go to MACK 0002301, please? Oh, sorry, 2301 underscore 022, please. Um, this was an email from Dr. Foster to you, January 2000. Um, I don't need to go through the, the detail of most of it. If we go to the bottom half of the page... Um, you'll see um, um, there's a list of uh, pharmaceutical uh, um, companies and um, uh, viral transmissions reported. In relation to Armour, it refers to there being 18 HIV transmissions um, published in 88 and 1990, plus two in Scotland not published. And if we go to the very bottom of the page, um, it says uh, um, it's referring to 
um, I think Dr Mike McGovern here, Mike seems not to be aware that Armour's factor rate was withdrawn from the UK following HIV transmissions in the UK, four cases in Birmingham, two in Glasgow's Royal Hospital for Sick Children. Um, uh, and then it refers to that product also transmitting HIV in the USA and Canada. Um, do, do you have... I, I appreciate that, that uh, um, this is not talking about SNBTS product. It's talking about seroconversions from the heat-treated armour factor eight, yes. um, said to be two in um, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. Um, but do you have any further knowledge about those seroconversions? I, I, I don't think I, I do. I would have probably had more knowledge and, uh, and, and recollection closer to the time, but uh, uh, after, the, after the passage of time, I, I'm aware, of course, that, that, that's, that there, there were reports of commercial products in particular continuing to transmit HIV. Um, but I, 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 I can't recall who Mike McGovern was. Uh, based, I think, at the Department of Health. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Not much, uh, I think that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so the, the next topic I wanted to m move to is, is just back to dedication. And we, we saw it touched on in that report from Dr. Cash, January 1984, yes. for the February 1984 yeah. SMBTS and Haemophilia Centre Directors yeah. meeting. Um, now, the, the evidence shows, uh, your own evidence it, it explains this, it, it, the, the batch dedication system was introduced from early 1985. That's correct. Um, can, can you assist us, first of all, by explaining how the particular batch dedication system introduced worked? Um, in, when it was fully implemented? Yes. Um, it was, it was um, a system whereby... Um, and, it, and it was predicated and, 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 and necessary to have large stocks of product to, 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 to make such a system work. And it involved um, um, uh, uh, dividing the patients, all the patients in Scotland who were treated with Factor VIII into patient groups on a, on a regional basis. So there might have been three patient groups in Edinburgh, six patient groups in Glasgow, one in Aberdeen, Dundee, Inverness, and so on. And, and I, I think we called them lanes, patient lanes. And they were allocated, I think, simply on the basis of, of, of the um, alphabetical um, surnames. And the, the PFC's role in, in the batch dedication system was to provide these so-called lanes with whole batches of product. The patients, when they received their product for treatment, from the, from the haemophilia centres would draw upon the stocks um, that were, had been particularly t from the lane that they had been allocated. And, and when that lane was empty, i.e. the patients had, had used up all the product in that lane, that batch would be replenished with another whole batch. So, it, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure how many patients were in each patient group, but I, I would estimate it would be in the region of 20 or so uh, maybe more, um, depending how many lanes had been established. And that system was designed to, to minimize um, um, patient exposure to donors. That, uh, and, and it worked very well. Once it was implemented, it worked very well. Uh, and uh, there are various documents and correspondence relating to it, but I, I don't think we probably need to go to those. But can you assist with this? Why, why was the system only introduced in early 1985? at which time you've, you've got a product which, in fact, inactivates HTLB3, albeit not non anon B hepatitis. Um, given that it was certainly under contemplation at the beginning of the previous year, and, and presumably as something that could have been thought of that earlier, even than 1984, um, wasn't it done really too late? Um, well, I don't think it was done too late. Um, but I think is, you know, as perhaps an opening comment, I, I, I think this, this is a, um, a, a topic that, that could have been addressed earlier. Um, I've thought um, quite extensively about this particular topic because it's become a, 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 an important issue. I think my, my, my conclusions are that it was perhaps not well defined who was, 
where the center of responsibility or the leadership for such a process existed. Um, the, the operation of it was primarily dependent on the regional transfusion centers and the hemophilia center directors identifying the patient groups and setting up the operational systems for making sure that individual patients only got the batch that they were allocated to. Um, and, and, and the PFC had no involvement or role in that. The PFC's role was simply to provide um, the, the number of batches necessary to sustain the system. So it was never quite clear, I, I think, even in the minutes of the, of the annual meeting of haemophilia centre directors and, 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 and transfusion directors, that it was, it was not defined who, who, if anybody, should take the lead in that. It was a, a sort of call to arms, I think, in some respects, to, to begin thinking about this and, uh, and, and determine its feasibility. Um, my, uh, my analysis of, 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 of the situation is that it, it, it's, uh, we had the product stocks in 1984, um, and, uh, and I think it's fair to say that had it been identified as a high, I, I, had, I had only just become acting director at that stage, and I think my priorities um, uh, lay elsewhere at that time, but had it been identified as a, as a high priori priority topic by um, transfusion centres or haemophilia directors, or indeed myself, and I, then I, I, I think it, it could have been introduced earlier. What, what, I'm, what I'm not clear on, though, is whether had it had it been introduced in 1984, the, the the infective batch that we've just talked about would have been included in one of the patient lanes um, uh, it, for a batch dedication system in 1984, and. Um, so there would have still been a tragic outcome, whether it, whether it would, be, would, would have resulted in more patients being infected or less patients being infected, I'm not sure. But I think I've described it in my witness statement as a lost opportunity. I think we could and should have done it sooner. Um, so I'm going to move on to another topic now. Um, given the time, perhaps we could pick that up at 2 o'clock. Uh, yes, well, let, let's do that. It's 2 o'clock. Thank you, sir.